This spring and summer 2019, prepare yourselves for an onslaught of stories about the many Boston Mass luminaries, innovators, change agents, trailblazers, pioneers, and legends whose successes we've celebrated but haven't received their due like the ones in other cities have. This is the Boston Legends Podcast, hosted by me, Dart Adams. All so, day. So, please I'm, continue. I, every pitch in the paper in high school, I'm like this. Yeah. <laughs> fake, fake knee injury for the knee brace like Mike, like straight up. I'm yeah. like Mike. And then and when I was at BC, people don't know, I, I read in Sports Illustrated, he wore North Carolina shorts under his Chicago Bull shorts. Mm-hmm. So every BC game, I would go in the bathroom where no one could see me and put North Carolina shorts on under my BC short. And they were short shorts back then. <laughs> so I had to cut the bottom of the North Carolina shorts. Yeah. But they was underneath those little ass BC shorts I used to wear. Um, so, yeah, I sidetracked with that. But um, where, where are we going with, with, the, with the original? The draft draft night. Oh, yeah. So funny story. I'm sitting in Chicago. I'm like, I'm, by the time I get home, there's like 100 people at my house. I just get home. The draft is like in an hour. So I'm start sweating. I don't even go home. I say hi to everybody. I go to my boy's house. And I'm just watching the draft with him. I'm telling you, yeah, I mean, I'm going to Chicago. And then David Stern gets up and he's like, with the 16th pick, um, Seattle selects Donna Bariosi. I'm like, who the fuck Donna Bariosi, right? <laughs> my boy's like, yo, that's you, that's you. And I swear to you, I was crying like a little baby because I did not want to go to Seattle. I didn't talk to Seattle. I didn't visit Seattle for a team because I want to go play with Mike. Yeah. And damn, man, that was crazy because I ended up going there playing with Gary and B.J. Armstrong gets drafted 21 and gets six rings. You know yeah. I mean? so, and he becomes Michael's boy. Yeah. And he's, <laughs> he was he was like GM over there for a while. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah, yeah, he got... He got a big deal and he got six rings. So man, I you know I still look back on that. But he also got picked first in expansion draft. Yeah. <laughs> and Michael yeah. Jordan was pissed about yeah, that. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. So you get to Seattle, right? What the hell happens when you get to Seattle? Because those of us that were old enough to know what was going on in Seattle with their guard situation. And that they wanted you to be a specialist because of your your height and your shot and everything else. Please explain that process. What was what happened to you when you first got drafted? When I first was drafted, it was great. Bernie Beckerstaff was the coach. Yeah. And uh with his family in Boston. Yeah, he, he used to just say, Baby boy, shoot that thing. Like if you ain't gonna shoot it, I'm gonna take you out, baby boy. Like that was that's what he drafted me for. We had Dale Ellis, who was one of the best shooters yeah. ever. And I would come in and just run Dale Ellis plays. <laughs> and if I didn't shoot it, he would say, I'm taking your ass out. And I drafted you to shoot it. So I was second team or third team all rookie. Yeah. Had a great rookie year. Um, Dale, Dale got hurt, and I ended up starting like 21 games, averaging like 17 a game, one rookie year a month, a couple of months. Great rookie year for me, you know, for a 16th pick. And then Bernie leaves. We get this week. We're in a lottery it, where it's the, we get the second pick. So I was begging that we got the first pick because Derek Coleman was the first pick, and I knew Gary Payton was going to be the second pick. So mm-hmm. we had Casey Jones was the new coach, yeah. who was a defensive coach now. And didn't like playing young players. Didn't, didn't like playing young players or didn't want to shoot the ball until you got the ball inside. Yeah. And he loved defense, so he loved Gary. So for the next three years, I sat on the bench, man. You know, um, me and Sean Kemp were rookies together, but he really, his second, third year, he really blossomed. But we would, we lived side by side. It was I mean I had a great time other than you know not playing because we won fifty games a year. Mm-hmm. But in those four years, I had three coaches. You know, I had eleven coaches in fourteen years, man. So it was like every time you go somewhere, they would, a new coach would draft a guard, and I would have to beat him out just to, just to be the second guard. You know, it was always kind of that that uphill battle, which you know it was good. I was on guard. 24-7, I was, my dean, my dean was on point, you know, so, like, all the time. Here's the thing about you, though. You were a combo guard in every sense of the word. You should have been a two, but they always slotted you as a one, but you were a two. What was that like? Well, it, was, it went both ways. Bernie, you know, Bernie, like I said, he, he always put me at the two. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So if you sit at the two for two years and you never play point, then the new coach comes in. Then you never play two, and you only the point. And he's asking why you can't make that perfect curl pass 
it's you know it's just it's not that easy, man. If it was that easy, everybody, everybody would be, be doing, doing it. it. You know, so <laughs> it was the the blessing and the curse. It was, but they had to play me. Like, dude, I would I would be sitting on the bench over there behind Gary. Not I might play thirty seconds at the end of the first half, and thirty a minute at the end of the third quarter, and then we come to the bench down two. They'd be like. Dana, <laughs> we need a three, call a three for me. I'm like, dude, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm like my second year. I ain't played in three games. But that would, you know, this is crazy how my, my wife at the time would tell me, that, to me, that just mean that they think you're good, that you you the hell of a shit. Like, and I'd be like, nah, that's some bullshit. Like, I, they set me up, you know what I mean? Like, I was on that. But I had to just accept the fact. This is business. Like, we we ain't telling you when you're going to play. And, you know, I just had to learn. You got to be ready at all times. People get hurt like that. I went from third string to first string my rookie year, like in, in two days, you know. So yeah. that was just a learning experience, man. You know, the, the league is something special. Like, dudes you think can't play, can play. Like, you know what I mean? Dude, like, like, I explained to somebody once that when somebody gets minutes and they start producing, that didn't happen by magic. They always had that ability. They just needed the yeah. opportunity. And a lot of times cats end up in a different situation in a different city. And all of a sudden it's like, why they let them go? Well, if they had the space to let them play, they would have done right. it. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, like what happened? You end up going to Philly. Yeah, I was again, I, I went to, to Seattle management my last year in Seattle. I was there four years. I had one year left on my deal. So mm -hmm. I'm like, and back then when I say deal, I... <laughs> 16th pick, I came out making like 150. You know, next year it was 200. Next year it was 225. Like it wasn't no mills and all this yeah. at the 16th pick. So um, I'm like, I went to the management. I'm like, look, man, like y'all got to trade me. Like I'm not coming. If I come back next year, y'all going to see the crazy day. Man. Like I've been professional. I said, but my, I don't know what I can do. You're not giving me a chance to do anything. I don't, I'm going to be out the league. This coach telling me not to shoot. That's all I can do right now is shoot. And they didn't believe me. So they I was supposed to show up at Summer League. And back then, I was like 20 grand. Fine, if you didn't go to Summer League, I didn't go to Summer League. I'm like, dude, I'm not coming. I'm like, I'm coming back when the season starts. Mm -hmm. So they finally traded me. Um, they traded me to Charlotte. And I'm like sitting at the crib like, now I go from Gary Payton to Muggsy Balls. Like now I'm, I'm like, I'm not, that's worse. He playing, he leading the league in minutes. Yeah. And assists. But it was a three-way deal. So they, I was in Charlotte for like a day, and then they they chased me to Philly. Again, new coach. They drafted a guy like in a um, late lottery pick. And then, you know, I had great two years. I just was ready, man. I just was my time. I, first year I was most improved player. Second year I was all-star. All and then that's when everything just came out. You know what I mean? I was the point and I was the shooting guard at the same time. Yeah. You know, like that that's Lukey was like, you know, they they started the rookie in training camp, beat him out, and then it finally after twelve or fifteen games, he just gave me bars like, just do whatever you gotta do. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And when you get that, the any line. player gets that, you know what I mean? And and at that level you're gonna produce. And, you know, I was yeah. able to do that. At the perfect time of the contract situation. Mm -hmm. When then AI was coming to Philly. Yeah. So, you know, they was they was I was actually getting ready to sign with Washington, which which had Chris Weber and Jawan oh, Howard. Yeah. So I'm in Washington and this is this is a crazy story because my agent is like this. Yo, yo, I'm 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 so glad you're gonna tell the story because I heard this from two other people, but please tell the story. My agent's like, Dana, I'm just gonna call ML and just tell him you're about to sign a multi million dollar deal. With the bullets, and do they want to make a shot at you? Mm. We're laughing. We're sitting at dinner laughing. Just got off the phone with Washington, going to Washington the next day. Mm -hmm. So he calls him. We're all sitting there listening. And man, I was like, uh, oh, 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 don't do nothing yet. Don't do nothing. I'm gonna call you right back. So we're like, whatever. You know, we're talking. We finish eating. I swear, like two hours later, and Mel calls. Off is like. Eight million more than what Washington was, mm -hmm. and like more years. Yeah, it's one more year, but mm -hmm. like an average of like two more year for four years. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, we're like bugging, <laughs> so, and I'm like, wow, he's laughing. He's like, you know, it worked. I need a bigger. He make. I need a bigger percent. So and Mel's on the phone. He's like, all right, we're gonna sign tomorrow. I'm like, the hell we are. I'm like, I'm coming down today. 
I'm signing this shirt right now. Yeah. It was like 4.30 on yeah. a Friday. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you ain't never going to get here to traffic. I had a motorcycle. I'm like, ML, <laughs> ML, I, I'm coming right now. And that took me like an hour, but I'm weaving on 93 with a motorcycle on because I had that sack waiting. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> dipping all up on the gravel. I said, no, nah, I, I, I'm not going to go to sleep tonight because mm -hmm. I, so I could die tonight. You know what yeah. I mean? Something could happen. I said, no, nah, we signed this today. So I, I, I went down there today and signed it. Dude, that there day. are pictures in the Boston Globe of you signing the contract. Mm -hmm. Then there's pictures of the press conference. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the pictures, full color, and I'm looking at what you're wearing. And I'm like, how did he get there? And people tell me, nah, dog, he, he drove. Like, he drove there. It was like, nah, man, he had a motorcycle. He, he went <laughs> there, like, to sign the contract, to sign the deal. Yeah. And I'm just like, no way. Yeah. So people thought I'd heard two different versions of the story. And it turns out, shit's true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, like I said, being blessed, man, I... That was something that I just couldn't foresee waiting to do. I just didn't understand, like, dude, like, it's not going to happen. I'm coming. You know? mm -hmm. So, again, it's just uh, when you have dreams sitting in front of you, man, you got to go snatch them out the air. You can't just, you can't wait. You can't sit around. I'm just not a sit around person. I want to be my own boss. I want to create my own opportunities. And what I do, use my talents to the best of my ability, if I can't get it done and I need some help with that, I'll absolutely reach out to anyone and anyone who's, you know, has the right and the same goals I do. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's what makes you don't see great people. There's no great people out here who are shy and don't speak up for themselves. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, they can be the nicest person in the world, but get them in the room and mm -hmm. see what happens when they get in the room. You know, So that's just what I would tell anyone out there is, I had so many people tell me, man, you're too little, you're too small, you need to play football. Like, just just do what you do. Yeah. All right. Being that you're a Mike dude, I know you have some stories. Give me a Michael Jordan story. Probably the first time you ran into him. Oh, okay. My Mike story. So, like I said, man, Mike is like everything, man. Like, I'm, 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 you know, I can't emulate him, but I'm just... He's just everything to me. He inspired me to want to play in the NBA. So I'm like, um, I'm drafted by, you know, Seattle. I'm going to Seattle training camp, and we get the little paper. First game we play against is Michael Jordan. We're in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. 60,000 people here in the kingdom, right? And I don't start the game, you know, um, and the game starts. And I remember the first time I catch the ball. I just catch the ball in the corner, turn around, and Michael Jordan was like this. Like, and he was like, Danny, you ain't shooting no threes, like something like that to me. But he, I, I, now that I look, you know, I got older, I look back. Chicago had told him and talked to him, these are the guys we might draft. So I'm like, how the hell does he even know? Me, right? <laughs> so I'm like in total awe, man. You know what I mean? Total awe. So I kind of like, Sean is in the post, like, give me the ball. And I'm like, nah, bro, <laughs> I've, been, I've been waiting for this forever. He thought that was hilarious. He's like, oh, come on, like, come on, bro. So... You know, get the ball, jab him, kind of go by him. And I'm, like, going to roll it up. And this big black hand was like, get that out of here. Like, slapped it, like, ten rows in the stands, you know. But, man, the crazy – he put his arm around me. He's like, yeah, I like that, little man. I like that. He's yeah, like, good to see you. He's like – he's like, he's like, he was something, like, to the effect of almost. You know what I mean? We almost – we was almost, he was almost here, something like that. And, we was, I mean, he was – after that, he was always cool. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Always cool. Um – but he was, he was the man. I want to don't don't even talk to me about that LeBron stuff, man. He was the man. Like stop mm -hmm. it. Like yeah. best defensive player in the league, his whole career, mm -hmm. and the best offensive player in the league his whole career. Like dude, I was there. I played against him. Like mm -hmm. the best defensive guard maybe ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right. I know people always want to say that when we are talking about Mike, but nah, I'm sorry, man. And right. LeBron's great, great, hell of a player, man. You know, one of the top, but. Nah, man. So back in the days coming up, um, earlier we were talking about uh, one of the players that I really attack, like was attached to because he played right there in my neighborhood in Northeastern, Reggie Lewis. Mm -hmm. but, also, but also across, not too far, right down on the green line was um, Dedrick Irving mm -hmm. who used to play him in the NEC. Yeah. So 
what was your interactions with Dedrick and Reggie Lewis who, at the time when Boston had some excellent basketball right here? Well, the crazy thing is it, it kind of the Boston thing carried from, you know, being small up to up to the college level where myself, Reggie and Dedrick used to play all summer. That Perry Moss, one of the Northeastern players, used mm -hmm. to come back and play with us. Um, and we used to find a gym, whether it was UMass. We would go play there at night and call a bunch of Northeastern BC players and, and play at night. But I, when, on my visits to BC, one of the on my um, second football visit, we went to the Northeastern BC game, and I watched Reggie play, and that's when I, the first time I, I got to know him, mm -hmm. um, was then. But um, that was unbelievable basketball in the city, man, because those teams were good teams, uh, really good teams. And BC stopped playing BU and Northeastern <laughs> because yeah. they were losing. They had nothing to gain. Yeah. It was a recruiting thing. If, if we're losing to them, yeah. you know, we're going to knock on – they're going to start taking recruits yeah. from us. And it was know? crazy because Calhoun was smart doing that. Yeah. He had Reggie, he had Lafleur, and he had some other guys that could ball. Yeah, Trey, he, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Andre Lafleur, yeah. And he used them to their to, – to, he used them – their capability. It's the reason why the man was so successful when he went to UConn. Definitely, you know. Um, so yeah, they. I used to actually go watch those two got those two games. Um, and then as I got into the league, me and Reggie for like two summers straight, we hung out every single weekend at you know Club Vincent's and in Randolph. And then the second summer was like main event in the Club Club in New Bedford every single weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, we was at the same spot. We always had the same little corner that we hung out in, and it was just damn. It was it was devastating, man. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, thinking about like at the time, there was like semi pro ball. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the team? It was the um the something magic. Was it the New England Magic or something like that? There was like a small semi pro league in New England. And they would travel around. Yeah. And they would play at the colleges because we played. They would come to BC in preseason and we would scrimmage them like in the live scrimmage. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of that. But there was a summer pro league. There was a summer pro. Yeah. League, yeah. Um, that was out at that time, and um, it was a really good. You had overseas players coming in playing. Sometimes games would start an hour and a half late. Oh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Always that, yeah. But I'm t man, Boston. Looking back, Boston really was a was a great place, man. It was like a melting pot of different areas of basketball that really turned out mm -hmm. to create a mm -hmm. a legacy. Now that you're looking back, man, over over the 20 years, man, you got some 10 to 5th, maybe 10 to 20 players now that have come through those yeah. that root system that was established by those guys. If you weren't here and don't know what I'm talking about. At the days where people would just sit around at different courts and different st stoops and talk about, yo, I went to, I drove down to the game and so and so played this new show. <laughs> he showed up forty five minutes late wearing the wrong <laughs> uniform. They had to switch out his uniform. Slip his arm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they had to switch out his uniform. The motherfucker scored forty. Yeah, like, right, right. So it was like those stories and like, yo, and then um Reggie Lewis came down and then like it was just stories, 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 stories of basketball. But something we haven't talked about. Uh. There's a lot of cats now that do the entertainment thing in basketball, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the people everybody talks about is um, right now you got um, you got homie from Portland, right? Dame, Dame. Lillard. You got Dame Lillard. Like, he can spit or whatever. Then he went back and forth with homie from um, Sacramento. The rookie, right? The, yeah, the young boy. Um, oh, Marvin Luke. Bagley, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we look back, I think it's 1994 or 95, there was a compilation called... Um, Boston basketball's, basketball's best, best kept, kept secret, secret. Yeah. and you had a song on there, which I feel like was the best song on there, called "Wreck It." Check it, dude. check it. Yeah, uh, it's all over YouTube, man. I have these little kids Google me, and that song comes up, and I got the little roster hat on. And I'm, you, you got the I single. Had to turn you had a that single. was nineteen ninety five. Cause they be coming up to me. I saw your video. It's all over, like it's on YouTube. So yeah, I, I it was on MTV, BET. Yeah. It was it was played in rotation. Single. Yeah, definitely. And there was another one that I did with um Brand Nubian. Yeah, Grand Poobah on the same album called "You Don't Stop." Um, yeah. So I did two singles on there. It was it was uh it was mm. a great experience for me, man. It's yeah. crazy. But like also, you also did a joint with um with Wise Guys yeah. and um RSO. Yeah. Um. Team player, mm -hmm. yeah, we were DB11. Crates, DB11. Man, DB11. DB11. I remember yeah, when yeah. it came out. No, yeah, yeah, I, I remember yeah. when it came out. I remember being in yeah. the studio. Yeah, 
Man, I was young then, man. I was that was some crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that um music is all I mean, man, I love music. Like I used to DJ when I was at BC, I used to throw parties in my room to make money. I used to charge five dollars to get in. I'd be in the back with the amp, with the fan on the amp, because the amp would cut out every hour because it was too hot and scratching. Like I was nice, like you know, like and the and I when I went to Philly, how I really learned how to be a a, a really good DJ was my man Jazzy Jeff was a Philadelphia Sixers fan yeah. and he took me to his uh, we, I went to his crib maybe 50 times and he lived on a like a, a, a cruise ship that was turned into condos on the water and this dude had turntables with his fish tank was like 40 feet long the whole wall was like a fish tank and you would scratch in front of the fish tank and he showed me all oh, man I was for those two years I was incredible like I'm talking I could run to could see into and like I was incredible this dude was teaching me everything. All he would go behind his like, and at the time I didn't understand how how he was the number one DJ in the world. He was just my man. He needed the remix to that single. Yeah, the Jazzy Jeff from West Philly remix yeah. is the best remake. It's, it's better than the original. What you're saying? But he taught it. me how to DJ. Like he was teaching me. When I look back at that man, if there was video of that man, like man, but he was he was. He still wins DJ championships this 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 um yeah, yeah this time now. still touring still still making albums doing yeah. everything independently his son's nice too it's um, crazy yeah. his son his son Amir, I think his son's name is Amir Amir Towns or something like that is nice yeah we follow around. each other he still does Jeff's beats you know every week and stuff like that but he does, he still travels the world man he's he DJs all over the world like, yeah. that's 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 his thing man. that's his thing all right so right now you work developing young players you have you know your basketball camp you have your facility uh talk about the differences in developing young talent or specialization with youth basketball now versus when you were coming up and why you're in this um specific space now well i mean man when i grew up it was one team babc mm -hmm. and we had to basically go out of state to connecticut or new york to play in tournaments and um it was either you come on the team, you see kids come and go because we would only take the ten or nine or ten best kids, and if you didn't play well, the two the two tournaments before that, your ass was just getting replaced. So next week you show up, there's three new dudes. You know, he went and found three dudes who we thought was better, and that's kind of how the AAU went. And um, there really was no AAU. I mean, again, I might have played two tournaments in the summer with BABC, and um, just growing up. Uh, never really having going to camps or anything like that my mother's just said hey why don't you do you know a free camp and i used to do a free camp at my high school and then it, actually i i said okay i'll do two separate parts of the camp i started working with miss harris i would say okay through the police athletically we would have 50 mm -hmm. kids a week come for free through the police athletically and then the crazy thing was when reggie passed I took over his camp. I didn't take his camp over. I took over the site yeah. because for years I would speak at that camp and he would have, you know, do a great job of um, the Miss Hat. You know, this is how I got Miss Harris involved. I took because that's what Reggie was doing. And I I took over that camp and then and I just really started to enjoy it because I would find these kids that I wanted to choke out on Monday, man. Like, I'm going to choke this kid out. If I can just get him in the back room. By Wednesday, he was my favorite kid. And then you realize this kid's got issues at home and he wants to discipline. He wants to learn. And when you, you approach him in a certain way, things change. And I started to realize that I could make a difference. I would have kids who I hated the, you know, I, I hated the kid at first, and then now he's working for me, you know, and he's one of the, the, the true people I can trust and say, be there at three o'clock, I know you're gonna be there. And when those things this is 30 years, I've been doing this since 89. Yeah. So as I retired, I said, man, I don't want to get no job. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to go to an office and be a coach and now I got to travel, do the same. Tra if I'm going to travel, I'm going to try to make a comeback. You know what I mean? Like, And so my mother, me and my mother, we started doing these things. These, we turned it into free things because I wasn't in the league anymore. I wasn't making money. To, we had a little a section of it that was still free, but we turned it into a business. Mm -hmm. And um, again, as I woke up every day, I, I wanted to do this, you know what I mean? I still worked out every day even when I retired. So that's how I got into the gym thing. I started renting gyms. I started running clinics. 
you know, and there was no internet still really until 2000, yeah. you know, five, so, so six. So like when uh, people could actually be on the internet right, 24-7. Right. So, and then once that happened, I could send out, you know, I'm going to be in Dedham. I'm going to be at um, the Reggie Lewis for two days from 9 to 11. No, and it just started growing, and then people just started saying, "Hey, he's teaching the kids." It was really young kids, really the young, like third grade to eighth grade. Um, the high school kids were really too cool. You know what I mean? They too cool. So, mm -hmm. I really just started cornering that market, and it got into facilities. And I had a facility, and I retired. You know, like I didn't listen to no one. You know, I went out, took half my bag, and built this big old beautiful place, and didn't take no loans and no partners, and mm -hmm. blew the whole bag. You know, so then I was like, okay, I sat back and I really started taking this internet thing. I started studying the game. I started saying, okay, how, how should I have done it differently? I waited about four or five years and then just came out and did it like 100% the right way. I, I, I think I have the best facility in the state. You know what I mean? It's beautiful. And we, we do have elite teams, but we yeah. teach fundamental basketball like we're, we'll take a, a basic kid and turn him into a good kid and you know that's what my goal is in terms of that because everybody knows who the good kids are yeah. everybody knows where they, they you know they already and they go from team to team whoever gives them the most anyway and i'm not chasing no fifth grader around <laughs> you know like yo man play on my team yo man i'm against some snake like nah it's not gonna yeah. happen like that yeah. makes i don't want that type of kid like if you if you was on three other teams i don't even like the parent might come to me i'd be like Honestly, I got three guards, you know what I mean? Because I know the parents going to be more of an issue than the kids going to be, yeah. you know what I mean? So, But I love it, man. I'm, I love teaching. I love waking up every day, going to my gym, you know, turning the series, stop the Dre channel on by myself, open up the curtains on five courts and work out for an hour because that's what I love to do. And that's what I want to do when I wake up every day. I want to do that for a living. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it was hard to – to go through the first one and people telling me I was crazy to, to want to do another one. You know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. like, this is my life. You know what I mean, I, I, I went out and earned this bread. I'm just what I want to do. I tried working as a coach. I tried doing this. It's, I don't enjoy it. I'm not going to do something I don't enjoy. So mm -hmm. that's where this whole thing came from. It's just what I love to do. And I'm not, I just don't want to do nothing else, man. You know, mm -hmm. honestly, I don't want to. I, I had two kids, two boys, um, that both in college, one just graduated college, and I think when they were 10 and 8, I was like, that's it, I'm not traveling no more, I'm going to every single basketball game, going to every single, I think it was 8 and 6, like, I'm, so at that point, I retired, I, I didn't miss anything, like, I just turned it around, you know, traveling's not as fun as you think, man, <laughs> it's fun for a little while, but no, nah. the same cheeseburgers I had every four seasons, <laughs> Across the country, yeah? Yeah. they got the same menu everywhere. Yeah. So, there are a lot of cats that grew up here and then got the opportunity, and but not a lot of them got the opportunity to play for their hometown team. Like, there's you, there's um, uh, Chris Heron. Heron played for. There's um. But the Celtics don't even want to talk about yeah, that time. There's, that there's, was a crazy yeah, time. There was, yeah. there was Wayne. Wayne got to be I was with there Rick when he Pitino was, yeah, he for a hot minute, and then Rick sent him home and said that he needed more experience playing basketball. It, when this shit stuck with me forever, right. Wayne played the most games in the history yes, yeah. of the NCAA. Right. Right. Wayne probably played more tournaments than any other kid of his ever. And, and then, he played for you. And he played for you. <laughs> For four years, Rick, every man. single game. And Rick says, you need more experience playing ball. Right. Can't believe it. But all right, let me get off that. Mm -hmm. Because Rick Pitino will be here all day. And I know you got Rick Pitino stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, who were the most underrated and overlooked players that you either played against or played with throughout all your careers? I would say, I mean, the toughest guy I ever played against him. So I, I still think he's underrated, even though he was like a four or five time All Star before he got injured. Was Tim Hardaway? Damn. Like Tim Hardaway was a problem. You know, like he could score thirty, but he would average he would average twenty two. So he could average fifteen assists with Mitch, with Mitch Richmond and Chris Mullen. You know, he could post right. up, the he could dunk, he shoot the three. Um, him and Kevin Johnson were the two people. Oh, um, goodness. 
Muggsy Bogues because I that probably was the only person that I ever played against that was faster or just as fast, if not faster than me, ever. Like I've never played someone where I could go by him, turn around, and then turn around and he's right there again. Like that's never that shit never happens. You know, like once I go by you and the Jets is on, like it's on. Like a, but nah, you go by him and you like, where he at? And then he's like, oh damn, he right there. Like he like so it was really more guys my size, you know, people would always try to post you up thinking that just that that wasn't an issue for me because um I just would get the lowest center of gravity. Mm -hmm. And I was a lot stronger than I looked, you know. Just knowing that was gonna be an issue for me, I was constantly mm -hmm. working on my body. But yeah, man, I mean those him hardaway was a problem. Like mm -hmm. one of the best guards I think in, of the era that before his knee injury. Mm -hmm. Chris Chris Jackson, my move with Abdul Raouf, oh, who was blackballed because of the Muslim thing. Um, and he and didn't want to stand for the um, anthem. The, the anthem yeah, you know? um, so he's definitely a sleeper, man. Like people, people, man, he was, he was for real, for real. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the era that you played with the Celtics, the era that you played with the Celtics, you played with some guards. You know what I'm saying? Like, you were around for like the David Wesley Wesley era. We had man when I got here. D Brown, Sherman. Du we were all on the Sherman same team. Sherman Douglas, Sherman Douglas, D Brown, me, um, David Wesley. Was Bagley around at that time? No, he no, had he just gone. he had just he left. Gone. But all four of us were playing point guard because they had Todd Day, Greg Miner, Rick Fox, all these other dudes playing two three. So mm -hmm. you know what I mean, it was. Um, it was a crazy time. Pretty Ricky, Rick Pitino mm -hmm. was three years, and Mel was three years, you know? So. Oh, wow. Man, just the idea that you played from ML Carr. <laughs> I Man. call him Uncle ML. He gave me that bag. That's Uncle ML to me. <laughs> Man, you played for Rick Pitino. Yeah. Two of the, uh, two of the uh, craziest uh darkest times in terms of Boston Celtics. It was coaches. a rough it was a rough six years for me, man. I think I um forty one and forty one was the best record we had. Yeah. And I mean we had some sixteen, eighteen win seasons in there as yeah. well. So it wasn't it wasn't uh pleasant, but to be home was always great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we pretty much covered everything and it was a pleasure speaking to you. Been a fan, been inspired by you playing ball. The guys that I came up with when I was a kid, one of the dudes used to yell at me all the time <laughs> was um Mike Bivens. Yep. Cause oh, man. Biv used to just yell at me. He's like, yo, you going to be tall, man. How come you can't go between your legs? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you, you got to be able to shoot, man. You, all you do is stand under the hoop and try to get rebounds. You're not going to be that tall. And then watching you play in BC and reading about you in the paper and hearing stories about you in the Bay State games, killing stuff, and in the Boston shootout, like, you were inspiration to a whole generation of kids coming up. Mm -hmm. And then you got to the league and was like one of the best shooters and like had accolades. And then you gave back to the community afterwards. So I just want to thank you for being here. All day, man. Inspiring. Boston all day, every day, man. It's an honor to be here. What you're doing is special, man. So uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. Yep. And you are the epitome of a Boston legend, man.